And we're just going to lift our eyes up to see our God seated on his throne and to adore him for his mercy. Please help us again in our hearts just to sort of reaffirm that nothing can compare with you. Nothing can compare with Jesus, with what you've done. Lord, so help us to adore you. Help us to love you this evening for everything you've done for us. Amen. We've looked at God on the throne. And who does Jesus love to talk about God as more than anything? Who does Jesus reveal God as? Our Father. 
our Father in heaven. His Father, our Father, by adoption, and the, just the amazing way he cares for us. we thank you this evening we can call you that our father in heaven because of Jesus we thank you that's who you are and Lord we just thank you we're loved by you we pray this evening as we hear your word that you'd fill Brian with your spirit Lord we'd hear your voice we pray you'd speak to us now amen
Evening, everyone. Sorry, I always feel bad drinking water in front of you, but Jean's drinking water there as well, so it's not too bad. <laughs> Everyone's hot and I be drinking water up here, but praise God. And um, we've been going through the book of Proverbs and RBT, reading the Bible together. And the, and the reason I'm going to do my own reading is because it's just one verse this evening. So, um, yeah, it's on there as well. Um, so let me just read that verse for us. You can follow it along there. It's in Proverbs chapter 12. Verse 1. Probably, I don't know what uh, page number it is in the church Bibles. Or 456. 456, here we are. 456. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. It says this. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Let's just pray together and ask the Lord for his help. Father God, I thank you for Jesus. Lord God, I thank you that he has come to correct all of us, Lord, and actually correction is a, a beautiful thing, Father, Lord, I know I hated it for many years, Lord God, and in my more stupid times I still hate it, Lord God, but Father God, please help us to see that you love us, Lord, that you want what we, what we need, Lord God. Lord, so help us, Lord, just to accept what you say to us, Lord. And not only that, not only just accept what you say to us, Father God, but to reap the benefits, Lord God, of listening to your voice, of trusting you. Lord, we, we are incredibly blessed beyond what we deserve, Lord God. And it comes from the charity that is in your heart, Lord God. So please, this evening, Lord, help us to open our hearts, Lord. Help us to accept in any area where we know we're going wrong and it can be a challenge to let you correct us. Lord God, please just help us to humble ourselves, Lord, and accept your word and to trust you to go forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's, it's quite a straightforward verse, although when I first heard that verse, verse I was very puzzled by it. Um, but I'll, sh I'll share with that in a second why. But just think about this question before we go on, okay? And be honest with yourself, because sometimes we, we're not honest with ourselves. Can Jesus correct you? Can he do that? If he was to say, you know, let's just think about that for a second. Can he correct you? He wants to correct you, but can he do it? Um, and ultimately, all he's doing is, is simply doing this. He's saying, that's the wrong path, and this is the right path. Can I get you to stop going the wrong path and go to the right path? Um, and just to think about, you know, what is correction? Um, one way that I've seen it this week was, you know, on the way back from school, I've got to climb that, you know, the big hill? I, it feels like the biggest hill in Barry. But it's a shortcut, actually, get, to get home. Um, it's, you know, where they, uh, they sell the cars down the road there, and you go up that road. And the postman said to me, he says, this will keep you fit. And I said, oh, you know, I, I just reacted, actually. I just said, it's a blessing from the Lord. It's not what I want, but it's what I need. And I think correction's like that, isn't it? It's not always what you want, but it's what you need. And Jesus might put a path in your way that is like that. And you can either say it's a blessing from the Lord, or you can, you can moan about it, etc. But it says here, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. And... I'll tell you why I was puzzled by that verse when I first heard it, because the, fir the first time I ever heard that verse, I'd read it before actually, but when actually somebody used it with me when I was, I was playing badminton, and I was playing this guy called Nor Nori Heard, he was an amazing athlete as it were, um, but I thought I was better than him because I thought I'm fast and small and agile, um, and we were playing badminton and he was demolishing me, I mean he was completely beating me, I, I, I never even got one win over the guy, and, and I'm... And I was stubborn, I was thinking, you know, I'm fast. And I was going like, what I was doing with badminton, I was running here, shh, running there, shh, running there. You know, and I was, and, the, and I thought maybe I need to go a bit faster. So I'd go faster, shh, shh, and I was sweating, and he was just going, pew, 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 totally beating me. Um, and he says, do you, want some, do you want some advice? And I went, no. Well, I said, I felt like saying no, but I said, yeah, please tell me when I'm going wrong. And he says, you, what your problem is when you play badminton is you, you don't stay central. You run here, you run there, and you, 
the exhaustion. He says, if you stay central, you might have to take a couple of steps, or, you know, like that. And it's always stuck me this. And you basically, you see, you lunge there and you do that. You, she's shaking her head because she knows the badminton, isn't it? You lunge there and you do that. And you stay central and you save your energy and you get to see where the badminton thing is going as well. And I, I got a wee bit offended, but I knew he was right, you know, because I was, I was exhausted. And he used that verse. He said, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who corrects, who hates correction is stupid. And I kept thinking about that Bible verse. I thought, what do you mean, actually? You know, love discipline, love knowledge. And I think it's a bit like this. And I think, you know, because when you read the Proverbs, you think, well, what is Jesus saying to us? But I think it's like this. The knowledge was, I wanted to be better at badminton. And I, and I wanted, the knowledge was, I got to stay central and, and do that, you know, instead of running around. So he was saying to me, there's a right way of doing it and there's a wrong way of doing it. And that's where the discipline comes in. He's saying, uh, Jesus said, I'll show you the right path from the wrong path, but the discipline is basically saying, now you're going to walk in that path. And ultimately, it's like, and it's interesting, it's like before you love the knowledge, you've got to love the discipline behind the knowledge. Because you could love the knowledge and say, oh, that's amazing. You know, I want to be saved. I want to be rescued. And I'm not getting this wrong where, like, you need discipline to be saved. But ultimately, what you're saying when you're saying, I love discipline, and then I love knowledge, is basically in one way, you're saying, I love being wrong and that Jesus is right. And I, and, and I love that. Not, and I wouldn't say it's like you stay on the path of saying, like, I love being wrong. It's the fact that you love Jesus is going to make it going to make it right. And I'm, I'm willing to walk in that. I'm willing to walk and accept I am a sinner. I have got it wrong. I live my life wrong. You know, as a, you know you're lunging here, you're lunging there into sin. And Jesus comes and says, you're on, you are on the wrong path. The way you think is wrong. Your heart is wrong. Those evil things that you're doing is wrong. And he's saying, but will you walk in that in your daily life? And if you think about it as a Christian, there is a discipline to it, isn't it? There's a constant discipline of saying, Jesus is right and I am wrong. And in one way, you're saying, I love being put on the right path. And the Bible says that a wise man loves correction. He loves to be shown this is the right way of doing it. But in order to know that right path, you have to first of all admit that you're wrong in a certain area. So I ask you again, can Jesus correct you? Can Jesus, if you take a moment right now, if there was a part of your life that Jesus puts his finger on right now and says, that is wrong. That, the way that you're doing that is, is wrong. And it, it's interesting, isn't it? You, what if Jesus was to say there's going to have to be a complete turnaround? Because you imagine your whole timetable, and Jesus went, your whole timetable is wrong. Every part of it. You'd be like, whoa, I can't, you know. He's very gracious and gentle in that sense, but ultimately, if, if you're not a Christian, and you're a sinner, isn't it? He's saying everything is wrong. And the, only, the right path is that Jesus Christ has laid down his life for your sins. His blood has covered your sins. He can forgive you, but you have to turn to him as a sinner and confess your sin and say, Jesus, I've sinned. I've done wrong against you. Please save me. It's, it's going to be a complete different direction, isn't it? And even you as a Christian, you might think, well, I've done that. You know, there's nothing now to be corrected. Well, <laughs> that'd be wishful thinking, wouldn't it? Like, Jesus, I've turned to Jesus now. There's nothing to be corrected about my character. You know, I'm a, I'm a servant-hearted person. I love all my neighbors. You know, I'm um, lovely to my children, to my wife, etc., whoever it is that you meet. But it's not true, isn't it? He still comes along, and I think Proverbs is like that. It's constant correcting. Here's the wrong path. There's the right path. Will you love, will you love that? Will you love being put on the right path? So think right now in your heart an area that Jesus is correcting you and keep it there and ask yourself that question can he correct me if he shows me the right path am I willing then to walk in the right path um, even though it could be it could be difficult and Proverbs covers a, a few um, quite a few things we'll go, we're going to zoom into a couple of them but it covers the love of money how do I respond with money you know do I love it it's like you know money is not evil but the love of money is evil and if that's what I'm going to live for it covers about being led astray by sinners you know they, they, they you I call it you got you got big ears to sinners when they talk you're like what are they saying what are they doing what's that gossip etc and it covers lustful desires sexual desires where it's 
um, that's, and it talks about you go down those wrong paths, it begins to lead to death and destruction. But a couple, one, a couple of them we're going to look at, so basically Jesus shows us, and it's praise God, isn't it? He doesn't just show you the wrong path, because sometimes you think that's what correction is, isn't it? I'll just show you the wrong path. That's what's wrong. Well, actually, he says, okay, there's the wrong one, and there's the right one. And I'm going to read a few Proverbs and just say, this is the wrong path, and then this is the right path. And ask yourself with each one, it might be a different one for you, can Jesus correct me? Can he show me the right path? And I'm going to love that, even though it means I've got to accept there being on the wrong path. So Proverbs 6.10 6, says this, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. And what is, one of the wrong paths is procrastination. It's not like not having a nap. I had a nap today. It was brilliant, Sunday afternoon. But, and I think that's what he's saying. It's a little sleep. It's a little slumber. Jesus says this is procrastination. It's like there's lots, there's lots of little problems. And that's why I think he says that one after the other, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to, to rest. He's saying you've got lots of little problems that you keep doing that you're in the habit of doing, and it makes you excuse for procrastination. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll turn to Jesus tomorrow. I'll read the Bible tomorrow. I'll, go, I'll serve in church tomorrow. I'll be a committed Christian tomorrow. I'll encourage somebody tomorrow. I'll be a good husband tomorrow. I'll be a good child to my, to my mom and dad tomorrow. Why? I mean, what's, what's getting in the way of it? Well, I like the little sleep. I like the little slumber. I like the little folding of my hands. And it's, I call it like lots of little pleasure pr problems. Because it's easy to say, well, there's one big pleasure problem. And Jesus said, that cannot be the problem. It can be lots of little ones. But I constantly like, I, I constantly like having my own time here and my own time there and my own time there. So that's why I've got no time for nobody else. And it builds up, isn't it? So Jesus said, that's the wrong path when you're like that. There's lots of little reasons why you don't turn to the Lord. There's lots of little things. And the right path is, he says this, and it's very interesting what G, how Jesus answers. He says, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. He has no commander, no overseer, no ruler, yet it stores its provision in summer and gathers its food in harvest. So he, he says to you, if you actually go to the ants. I don't know if you've seen ants. They're amazing things. You get loads of different species of them. And they go in some little army and they build amazing stuff. Um, and it says they've got no commander, no overseer, no ruler. It's saying nobody's telling them to do that. Because you might say, well, I, need, I constantly need somebody to tell me to be a kind person. Constantly need somebody. And you actually do have a commander, don't you? You've got Jesus, isn't it? And they're saying they've got none of that, yet they still do it. There's a documentary I've seen where um, the ants, they live in water, basically. And when they, they've got their nest, and when the water rises, it, basically they can't do anything. They're all, all the ants are stuck. But it goes in a tide, this, this water. But when, as soon as the water comes down, you see them, they all come out. And when they come out, they'll do repairs, they'll, they'll gather the food, um, and they'll build their nest, you know? And one of the things you observe with ants is they'll do things at the right time. And Jesus is saying that you, you know, one of the things I heard one preacher say, you've got to have a theology of time. You have a certain amount of time to reach the lost. You have a certain amount of time to, to, to um, change, isn't it, in that sense, into the person that Jesus Christ has called you. You have a certain amount of time to turn to the Lord, isn't it, if you're not saved. And he's saying, that he'll give you that resource of his Holy Spirit, but you've got to act when the water is down. And it's, these, these ones will go amazing life. Some of them will even swim. I don't know if you can see an ant swim, but this ant was swimming. And it made me think, you know, there's a discipline, isn't there? You know, we, you think about going to church, going to prayer meetings, going to Bible studies. So would, you, would you be willing to swim? Would you be willing to go through that discipline in order to say, um, in order to serve, isn't it? And one thing is, they, like I say, they don't need constant reminding. They just do it because it's the right, the right thing to do. They see that the water is down, and they see that that's their time to build. And Jesus says, we've got to observe that. We've got to look at them and think they, they just, they're, do, they're constantly moving, the ants, but actually one of their characteristics is they'll get things done in the right, in the right time. Um, next one, Proverbs 19.8. It 
It says, discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to, to their death. And no one, isn't it? No one. Not many people, mothers and fathers, like to be corrected about their children, don't they? But it's not us correcting. It's Jesus. Jesus is saying this, and he says, don't neglect to discipline your children. Don't just give up on them and write them off. Because he says, the reason you don't do that is because there is hope. And sometimes we can look at children and say, oh, there's no hope for them. We're going to write them off. Um, there's a verse that says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. So what Jesus is saying, Jesus knows as they're born, folly is all tied up with the heart. It's not like all of a sudden, where did that folly come from, that sinful behavior? It says it's always going to be tied up in there. But that discipline of, of disciplining our children, it says not only will it... Rem- you know, it's not like a guarantee that they're going to be saved, but it's saying that rod of discipline will drive it far away. It's saying that it can all be tied up around them, but as you discipline them, in, as we grow them up in the, in the fear of the Lord, it can be driven away. But I think what Jesus is saying is don't neglect that. Don't think, oh, it's taking so long, you know? Three years, four years, five years, they're still not listening. It says, as parents, we need to keep disciplining our children. Another proverb is this. The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. So Jesus in the wrong path is just to speak. Sometimes you just gush stuff, isn't it? I just talk, 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 talk. And all sorts of evil just comes out of your mouth, isn't it? Jesus, and the right path is Jesus says, you've got to weigh what you're going to say. Weigh it up. Why am I saying these sorts of things? What does it matter? Isn't it? The Bible says, don't let any, any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who are listening. So he's constantly saying, this is the wrong path, and this is the right path. But the question is, can he correct me? If he shows me that I'm speaking just rubbish, and I think, Lord, what am I doing? I'm just gushing out. And he's saying, the answer is, you need to really think about what you're saying, and then say it. Like, can I, can I be corrected? He'll give you all the help to correct you. Think about a couple of um, Bible examples, isn't it? Um, Joseph, isn't it? He's thrown into prison. He's thrown into slavery. And yet, even in front, you know, when you're in prison, you know, most like the, the masters there are not very nice, aren't they? He received favor from the Lord from both of them, but ultimately the, there's harshness. But even though he's in prison and he's in slavery, slavery, he continues to serve Jesus. What's the correction there? Because we're constantly being corrected in the Bible, isn't it? 1 Peter 2 says, Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters. Not only are those who are considerate, good and considerate, but also those who are harsh. So he's saying, even though your boss is a harsh or a nightmare, you've got to still submit in reverent fear. And Joseph does that, isn't he? Even though he's in slavery, even though he's in prison. Think about um, Jacob in the Bible. So Jacob is a man who is constantly manipulating the situation, constantly trying to get his own way. And he wants to do it. There's a good reason why he wants to do it. He wants to be, he wants to be blessed by God, isn't it? So he thinks, I'll constantly try and manipulate the blessing from God. And what happens is he finally just comes in honesty with God. And he just comes, as we heard this morning, isn't it? He comes to God and just says, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what happens? He receives a massive blessing from the Lord. He says, I'm going to come as a sinner to you. The wrong path is trying to manipulate it all. I'm going to actually just come, as he says, to go to him as a sinner and see what happens, isn't it? Not as a, like you just go by yourself, but actually go for that mercy, isn't it? And saying, I'm, come, I'm, I'm going to the Lord based on the blood of Jesus Christ. You said you'll save sinners, and now all you've got is a sinner before you asking for your help. And he finds himself getting tremendously blessed. And he must have thought that all the other stuff that he was trying to do was a waste of time, isn't it? And he spent years trying to manipulate the situation. He pretended to be somebody else. He, he, he said lies, and so, etc. You know, even dressed up as his brother, isn't it? And you may be thinking, well, that's not me, but how many times can we do that? And when Jesus is just saying, just, you come as a sinner and ask for mercy and say, I am a sinner and I need your help. And do you think there's going to be a blessing in that situation? 
And there is, there is a blessing, isn't there? So Jesus is just continually saying, this is the wrong path, there's the right path. Are you, are you going to be willing to walk in it? But the question is, what if you don't let Jesus correct you? Because you might say, well, I know what he's saying. There's an area in my life that he's, you know, might not be, this, these were just free proverbs. There's loads of them. And I don't know, when you first read them, you're like, oh my, oh my, oh my. Every one of these is just ripping my life apart because I've been doing all of these. And, um, but, the, but there's a serious thing about it. It says, what happens if you don't let Jesus correct you? Well, what Jesus says, what's going to happen, it says this, whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life, but whoever ignores correction leads others astray. So Jesus is saying, whether you like it or not, this is what's going to happen. Round about you, you're going to lead other people astray. You may be thinking, well, I don't want to lead other people astray. I'm happy for me to say, no, Jesus, I, I, I you know, I won't get into my Bible as much as I should. No, Jesus, I won't pray like I know how you're calling me to you. I won't witness like how you're calling to me to you. I won't go to church the way that you're calling to me. And just let that affect me. And Jesus said, it won't affect just you. The next generation will watch it and you'll lead them astray. It's not like Jesus can't overpower that. But what he's saying is whatever they're prone to backsliding, whatever they're prone to go the wrong way, that's the way they're going to go. They're going to look at you and say, that's, that's, where, I learned, that's where I learned it from. That's who showed me that, that direction. So in one way, it's like you've got a responsibility. He's saying, this is the wrong path. This is the right path. And as they see you go on the, the right path, it says, whoever heeds discipline shows the way to life. And whether you like it or not, that's the same as true. You're going to show them the way to life. Sh- how did, you know, I, I won't spoil it, but there's something coming with Azad sharing it. But ultimately, like, you know, how does your children see the to love the Bible because you love the Bible. How does your children see to love prayer because you love prayer? They're not going to, they're going to see you struggle, but how do they see you struggle and still keep following Jesus because they're going to watch you? And the same is true when they see you push it away or they see you love and sin, they're going to follow that. So we have a tremendous responsibility to show that next generation whether we like it or not, we're, going, they're going to, we're either going to lead them astray or we're going to show them the way to life. And just to end with, you know, as we thought about that question, isn't it? Like, can Jesus correct me? You know, think about how Jesus corrects you on the cross. Because he ultimately, on the cross, you know, he does it, he does it all in one place, doesn't it? On the cross, he's going to show you the wrong path, and he's going to show you the right path. So the wrong path on the cross is he condemns sin in the flesh. Nobody looks at the cross and thinks sin is amazing. Because you think that's what sin has done to him, isn't it? Your, your sin, what happened is Jesus Christ came to you completely innocent. The darling of heaven, it says, isn't it? You know, the one who is good, he went about doing good, healing the sick, opening the eyes of the blind, um, the deaf here, the mute sing, the lame walk and jump for joy, isn't it? You know, he comes completely good, completely innocent. And he, but then he says, I'll take your sin on my body and I'll die on the cross in your place. And he, keep, he shows you the wrong path, doesn't he? He shows how sin brings shame. He shows how sh- sin brings death. It shows you that you're cut off. It shows that you're cursed. It shows that you're robbed. It shows that there's violence, there's bitterness, there's cheating, there's lying, there's rejection. All of that you see on the cross. And ultimately, in one way, he, on the cross he's correcting you, saying sin is definitely the wrong way, isn't it? If this is what it does to you. But on, on the flip side of that, he shows you the right path because he's dying in your place. So he's saying through this sacrifice, it's the, it's the most amazing place in the world, isn't it? Because you look at the cross and it's like, it's completely torturous, yet it's the place of the most love that you've ever seen, isn't it? Because when you have that knowledge, you love the knowledge, isn't it? Whoever loves knowledge, isn't it? But it says, do I love the discipline? Ultimately, he's saying, you're on the wrong path, but you can be on the right path. And he's saying you're loved, you're protected, there's victory, he gives wisdom, there's eternal life, paths are made straight, you're blessed, and you, you no longer have to be afraid. And he does all that, isn't it, on, on the cross for you. And Jesus is saying, sin is the wrong way, but his death on that cross is the right path for you. And the question is, can he correct you? And he's shown you both clearly what is the wrong way, isn't it? And he's showing you both clearly what is the right way. 
We're saying, do I, you know, it's that verse in it. Whoever loves, um, who, let me read it there. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. You might love the knowledge. He's dying for me. But do you love the discipline? Because the discipline is saying, I'm wrong and he's right. I have to accept that I'm completely wrong and he's completely right. And it says there, whoever hates correction is stupid. It is the most stupid thing in the world, isn't it? For somebody to say, that's the wrong path and this is the right path. And for you to hate that. I hate you telling me what the right path is. It's, it's just completely stupid, isn't it? So don't, let, don't leave here. Don't leave here stupid. That's what Jesus is saying. Just love the correction and walk in it. Walk in the discipline of that correction. It means I've got to keep going to Jesus and turn to him. Let's just pray together as we end. Father God, thank you. Lord God, I know I was stupid many years, Lord God. And all I had to do was just accept that I was wrong and you're right, Lord God. So please, Father God, this evening, whatever area of our life, Lord, you, only you can do that by your Holy Spirit. Just You've highlighted something in each person's heart. They can look, at, look up the front and say, oh, well, that's okay for that person. But actually, you've put something in their heart, Lord, that they know is the wrong path. And Lord, but the good news is you've shown them the right path. Lord, please help us to walk in the right path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, if we can stand ready to sing. And uh, how is all this going to be done? Not from us trying, is it? Our best. But like Brian's been saying, through Jesus' power at work in us, the song is just reminding us that not I, but through Christ in me.
I think this verse from Hebrews sums up what we've heard tonight. So if we can raise our hands. My son, that's who you are if you've trusted in Jesus. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes or corrects you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone or disciplines everyone he accepts as a son. Lord Jesus, please help us to be always able to be corrected by you and teachable. Help us to love not just the knowledge, but the discipline, Lord, because you love us. Amen.